go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, thank you for this morning. Christ, the glory, tis the story. It's all about you, and we just thank you. We're here to praise you. We're here to honor you. We're here to grow deeper in love with your word and love with you. And I pray this morning you will just illuminate your text to us. You allow your word to speak to our hearts and transform us and sanctify us, Lord. Uh, grow us more in your image. We thank you for this time, how we praise you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, turn with me. We are in John chapter 11. 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. How many of you had a good week? How many of you had a so-so week? How many of you just had a flat-out bad week? I'm sure there's some out there. I'm sure some of you probably had a week. Maybe that wasn't all that you expected it to be. Maybe it didn't go according to the plan that you had. And I was recently reading a story about a mother. She was also having a really bad day. She writes, I had a great day planned out, but it turned out to be one of the worst days of my life. The washing machine broke down. The telephone kept ringing. My head ached. And the mail carrier brought me a bill that I had no money to pay. Almost to my breaking point, I lifted my one-year-old into his high chair. I leaned my head against the tray, and I began to cry. Without a word, my son took his pacifier out of his mouth, and he stuck it in mine. <laughs> How many of you ever had days like this? You have a certain way you want everything to go, but then little by little, it just starts to disintegrate and fall apart. And maybe it's not a day, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month where you're just taking a step back going, Lord, what is going on? Why are these things happening? Sometimes our plans fail the way we want things to go, and it can hurt, can it not? Sometimes it can hurt bad. We have a great plan. We think that it's going to be something that's going to just make our lives better. But in the end, it really spins around and it has the counter effect. This morning, we come face to face with two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they have a great plan. They're confident that it will work, but it doesn't. And they come face to face with the one, the one who could have made it work. But he didn't. But through their failed plans and broken hearts, they come to understand that Jesus, he has something much bigger, something much greater than their plans. You see, Jesus doesn't conform to their plans because he sees the bigger picture. And he knows exactly what he is doing. And when they learn to trust him, they will see and experience things that they could have never even imagined. Now here in chapter 11, we are quickly entering into Passover, the Passover week. Chapter 10, we were at the Feast of Dedication, which happened, which is Hanukkah, that happened around the Christmas time frame. We are now literally in Christ's final week. We were leading into him, uh, mounting the foal, the colt of a donkey, and riding into Jerusalem. So from chapter 11, literally through chapter 21, we have one week of commentary that John is going to give us right here. And the first place that he goes on his way back to Jerusalem is Bethany. Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem on the way over the hill and into the city. And in Bethany, Jesus had close friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they know that Jesus would be there for them and he they know that Jesus would heal Lazarus because he just came down with a really horrible sickness they know that he would be there because Jesus loves this family he cares deeply for them 
So they send a letter hoping that Jesus will arrive. They send a letter to him hoping that he will get there in time to be able to help their brother. And they also believe that once Jesus hears about Lazarus' sickness, he would intervene and heal him because, again, Jesus, he loves him. As this passage makes very clear. So this is their plan. Tell Jesus their brother is sick. Get Jesus to come quickly and to heal him before he dies. And as a matter of fact, when we read this passage, after this letter is sent, the response is quite puzzling. Jesus doesn't really uh, act the way that you would think that he would act after receiving this letter about Lazarus. Matter of fact, in verse 4, Jesus tells his disciples that Lazarus is sick, but then he tells them that he won't die. But then 10 verses later, just 10 verses later, Jesus tells them that he is in fact dead. And then in verses 5 and 6, he says that because he loves Lazarus, he's going to stay where he's at and he's not going to go to him. That is odd behavior, don't you think? But as we have seen throughout John's letter, throughout this gospel, Jesus doesn't always act the way that we expect him to. Even when he healed the blind man, he didn't just simply say, hey, you are healed. What did he do? He mixed mud, spit on the ground, mixed the mud, put it on his eyes. Jesus has his way of doing things, and his ways are always, always perfect. And nothing is without purpose. Nothing happens by chance, as we will soon see. Now, I'm sure that both Mary and Martha, they were watching out the window. They were watching intently, waiting for Jesus to come, because this letter would have taken a day to reach him where Jesus was at, on the outer side of the territory where he was doing his ministry. So it would have taken about two days for Jesus to return. A day for the letter, a day for Jesus to come back. But he doesn't come. He doesn't come. One day passes. Two, day, two days pass. Three days pass. Now we're on the fourth day. Where's Lazarus? Dead. Lying in a tomb. All seems lost. But it's not. Let's pick up the story here in verse 7. Then after this, he, Jesus, said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. So Jesus, he receives this letter. He tells his disciples, it is time for us to go back to Judea. It's time for us to go back to the region where there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yes, they want to kill me. I understand that. But I have work to do there. We need to go back. Now, do they think this is a good idea or a bad idea? really bad idea, right? They know what awaits Jesus. They know the hostility that these religious rulers have for him. They've seen it in action. They know the hatred. But Jesus, being God in the flesh, he's not worried about their hostility. That's the least of his concerns. He had a mission, and that mission was to be carried out until his father gave the word. You see, Jesus saw his allotted time span on this earth as a day. He saw it as a day. But when the Father said, your time is up, when the Father says, it's time for you to give your life as a ransom for many, when the Father says, it is finished, it is time for the cross, that is referred to in Scripture as Jesus' hour. And Jesus is telling him right here, he's telling his disciples, it's still day, it's still time for ministry. My hour has not yet come. They cannot take my life until the Father says it is time. That's what he's explaining to them right there in verse 7. He's saying, you know what, we go to Judea, but there's 12 hours in the day. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. My time is still now. They can do nothing to me. 
He knew where he was going. He definitely knew what he was doing. And he knew all that happened was in accordance with his father's plan. How did Jesus know, you might ask? Jesus has made it very clear that I and the Father are what? One. Everything the Father knew, the Son knew. They walked in perfect unity. Their plan was perfect in every detail. They were walking side by side, hand in hand. Literally, prostantheon, which it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right there with that verse is saying in John 1.1 1, 1, that he was face to face with God. They were literally one in every way. The Father and the Son were working this mission together. But it's interesting right here because the disciples aren't too convinced. And Jesus just told them that Lazarus has fallen asleep. But what did Jesus mean? What does he mean? Now, the disciples, sometimes they're not exactly too bright, right? They sometimes hear Jesus is saying, and they just don't get it. It goes vroom, like a 747 right over their head. And this is one of those instances. Jesus tells them, hey, Lazarus is sleeping. And they're like, great news. That means he's going to get better. If he's, you know what, he's convalescing. He's getting his, he's getting his rest, and that's going to enable him to recover. That's awesome news, Jesus. We could stay right here. We don't have to go back into the enemy land. They think it's a good thing. They might have even thought that Jesus already healed him. How did Jesus heal the nobleman's son? Do you remember? He just spoke the word. Did he have to go into Capernaum to heal him? No. He just said, your son lives. And I think right here, the disciples are probably thinking the same thing. Jesus healed him from afar. We're safe. We're good. We're not told, but it's a possibility. But Jesus clears up any ambiguity right here in verse 14. Look what he says. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. How did Jesus know that Lazarus was dead? How did Jesus know that Nathaniel was sitting under the fig tree? Or the, yeah, I believe it was a fig tree. How did he know these things? Because he's God. There's nothing he didn't know. There's nothing he did not know. But Jesus says something right here that should cause us to pause. Was Jesus glad that Lazarus died? Absolutely not. But by his death... By his death, it opened a door for an even greater miracle than simply healing him. You see, Jesus knew that his disciples needed to grow in their dependence on him. They needed to see him for who he truly was. And Jesus has already done some incredible miracles. Matter of fact, he strengthened them once before by going and walking on water and walking by their boat going and saying, Hey guys, in the middle of a storm. And then he got in the boat with them and said, Peace be still. And the water just silenced. Jesus has done miracles to strengthen the believers. And this one right here, this is one of the greatest miracles that he has performed. And it is for that purpose. You see, Christ delayed coming to his faithful followers in order to strengthen them. He needed to strengthen them for what was about to take place. Because Jesus' hour was in fact coming. They knew they weren't going to deter Jesus in going to Judea. They knew he was on course. So they reluctantly, they follow him. Look at verse 16. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go. That way we could die with them. <laughs> now, that's not exactly a very happy thought, don't you think? Good old Thomas. If there was an Eeyore in Scripture of the disciples, Thomas was the Eeyore. Let me tell you. Okay, men, he said, put on your mourning clothes because we're heading back to Jerusalem so that when they kill our master, they can kill us too. Yay. Thomas earned the nickname Doubting Thomas. And a lot of us reference that to when Jesus had risen from the grave. 
And he appeared to Mary and Martha and to several other disciples. But what did Thomas say? He said, I will not believe that he has been resurrected from the grave unless what? I see his nail-pierced hands and I see his, his pierced side. Thomas needed to see proof. He needed to see proof. You see, his nickname is Doubting Thomas, but the truth is, he was just voicing, I guarantee, what they were all thinking. They all knew this was likely going to happen when they go back to Jerusalem because Jesus was hated. They did not like him. But I think Thomas should have a better nickname. I think a true nickname for him. And you know what it should be? Logical Thomas. Logical Thomas. Because it was not illogical to believe that they would be put to death when they returned to Jerusalem. Feast of Dedication again. The Pharisees, they had rocks, big rocks, staged in the temple so that they were prepared to kill Jesus when they were given the opportunity. And they knew, the disciples saw this happen. They knew that that's the animosity that they had towards the Lord. Several times they have tried to kill him. And what Thomas feels will actually happen. Not only to Jesus, but all of the disciples, minus John. We see that they were all martyred for their faith. So what he is saying here is logical. Yes, you go back to Jerusalem. You, you, you put in a notice on yourself saying, hey, kill me. And they know it. You see, Thomas is logical. But the problem is, human reasoning can't account for the divine. It only goes so far. And like Thomas, I hate to say it, but we're the same way. We tend to only want to believe when we can figure everything out. We want to look at everything and say, okay, well, this makes sense and that makes sense, but this right here, no, this doesn't make any sense. And we do it all the time. Think about this. We have friends with our co-workers or our friends, and we know they don't know the Lord. We know they're not saved. We know that they need to hear the gospel. But then in our logic, what do we say? We say, you know what, if I share the gospel with this person, they're just going to deny it. They don't want to hear it. And you know what? By us keeping our mouth shut, because we think we're being logical, because we think we know how they're going to respond. But what are we doing? We're, we're keeping ourselves from watching God work and perform a miracle in that person's life, if he so chooses. We miss out on the opportunity to be used for His glory. How about our finances? When our finances are tight, and with $6 gasoline, finances are tight, amen? But when finances get tight and we start looking at our budget and we start saying, you know what, I have enough money for this, I have enough money for this, I have enough money for this. Man, but my giving to the Lord, I just don't have enough to give like I used to give. You see, in our logic, we look at that and say, there's not enough. But what we're doing is we're denying God the blessing of using us by being faithful to Him. Because God takes what is illogical to us and He turns it into a blessing by showing us, ah, I work outside of your realm. I work outside of what you think is reason. Again, we miss out on the blessing of watching Him work through our finances even. You see, our logic, it only takes us so far. God wants us, you need to understand this, God wants us to believe Him at His word. He's a supernatural God. He's a miracle worker. And He wants us to trust Him in all of our circumstances. Amen? Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. We need to pause right here. Because this is no insignificant detail that we're given. This is key to understanding this entire text. Why did Jesus wait four days? Now, there are several reasons, but this is... I believe a major reason that we're given right here because there was a common belief within the rabbinical tradition that when someone died their soul departed 
But it only went so far. When they're sold a part of their body, it hovered over their body. And they taught this. The soul hovered over their body for three days. Now, if that person was to be resuscitated, if there's some way that person miraculously just came back to life, and I use that term lightly in this rabbinical tradition, but if that person was to be revived, it could only be done within those three days because the soul was hovering right there, waiting to jump back into the body. But what happened on the fourth day? On the fourth day, the body starts to decay. The smell starts to come. And at that point, the soul leaves. It's gone. No miracle can take place after the third day. Do you see why this is so important for Jesus to arrive on the fourth day? You see, the Jewish authorities couldn't say, well, Lazarus was dead, but he wasn't really dead, dead. He's only been dead for two days. He's not really dead. If he was really dead, it would be four days. No. Jesus wants them to know without a shadow of a doubt, Lazarus is dead, dead. He's gone. So what he's about to do is beyond the bounds of nature. They have no excuse. Even with their teachings, they're thrown out the window now. Lazarus is deceased. Nobody can claim anything but a divine miracle is taking place right here. Understand, Mary and Martha had a plan. Jesus has an even greater plan. So he takes his disciple on the final leg of their three-year journey to Bethany. But Jesus' reunion with his friends, it's not initially a joyous celebration by any means. Lazarus has died four days earlier. There had been many who had come to their home to mourn with them. And I believe that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were probably prominent in the Jewish, in the, uh, in the Jewish culture within, within their friends and family, possibly well off, because they have many who come to mourn with them. But right here we see that the word gets out that Jesus is in fact on his way. Look at verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, Martha had likely recited those exact same words over and over again over those four days. Lord, if you had been here, if you were here, my brother would still be alive. Listen, Martha had a plan. She sent for Jesus to fix the situation. But things didn't work out the way that she thought that they would. And the question that she asked the Lord is direct to the point. Jesus, you could have saved him if only you had been here. Why? Why have you let this happen to us? Listen, Martha wants answers. Why, Jesus? Why did you not intervene and stop this tragedy? And she's not alone. Jump down, look at verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen, both Mary and Martha were confused as to why this, was, why this was happening. How many times before Jesus arrived? How many times did they ask this question? Jesus, where are you? How many times in their grief did they not say, if only Jesus had been here, our brother would still be alive? They thought that they had everything planned out and it would all go according to what they had planned. Call on Jesus, he'll fix it. But he didn't, and now their hearts are broken. They're hurting. Beloved, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that way? A trial overtakes you and you cry out to the Lord for help, but you don't receive an answer. Jesus doesn't fix your problem. He doesn't fix the situation. Maybe the trial becomes even worse. 
And now this situation looks hopeless. You may not verbalize it, but you think it. Where are you, Lord? Where are you? You came too late. Where were you when my loved one died? Where were you when my marriage dissolved? Where were you when my parents divorced? Where were you when my dad became an alcoholic? Where were you when I grew up in an abusive household? Where were you when I was cheated out of a promotion or when my children went astray? We've likely all had those moments. Maybe not all of those by any means, but we've all had moments where we've just said, Lord, where are you? But I want you to see right here that Jesus doesn't reprimand her for asking the question. I think there's good reason for it too. You see, it's not sinful to tell God how you feel. He wants us to be real with Him. However, we also need to remember He is the sovereign of the universe. He is holy. He is the Almighty. And when we approach Him, we approach Him with humility and reverence. For He alone is God. But He still wants us to come to Him. He wants us to pour out our hearts. It's also important to understand, as His beloved, you have been given the incredible opportunity of sharing how you feel with your Heavenly Father. Where we cry out with, with the Lord, Abba, Daddy. And we can go with Him and express ourselves. And you know what? Well, most of the times our feelings aren't exactly right. But it's okay. It's okay. They should still be brought honestly before the Lord. And you need to remember, He already knows how you feel. He's God. He already knows your heart. He already knows your grievances. He knows everything that's going on in your life. But He wants you to come to Him and express it to Him. And to be real with Him. Listen, God knows you better than you know, than you know yourself. Look what He says in Psalm 139. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. You see, our problem is caused by the misconception that New Testament Christianity requires good Christians never to cry out to the Lord. Somehow, we get this mindset that we're just supposed to be stoic. Just buck up and bear it because, you know, that's who we are. Just grin your teeth and you just keep walking. But that's not what God wants. He wants us to be real. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest Psalms of David... You know what he's doing? He's pouring his heart out to God during difficult trials. Listen, David loved the Lord. We were told that he was a man of God's own heart. He tried to faithfully serve him. He loved him. But did David walk through some dark valleys? Oh, you better believe it. Matter of fact, in his early, in his early life, you had King Saul who's hunting him down, who's trying to kill him. You have David running and hiding in caves, hoping that he wouldn't be found so he could just live one more day. This was David's early life. Listen, David felt abandoned. He felt lost. Right here, Martha, she feels abandoned. She feels lost. Where are you, Lord? Going back to David, when he was in the cave, we have an entire psalm written on that, Psalm 13. Listen to what, how David speaks to the Lord. He says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say, I prevail over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. 
but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Notice this. David cries out to the Lord. He says, Lord, why are these things happening? But what does he come back to in the end? I stand in you. I don't understand this. I don't know why these things are happening, but I stand in you. You are my rock. You are my trust, and I will not be swayed. God wants us to come to him. He wanted it from David. That's what he desired from Martha. This is what he desires from us. He wants us to bring our hurts and our fears before his throne. But we must not also lose sight of the fact that he loves us deeply and he holds us tightly in his hand. And we need to trust his plans for us, even when we don't understand them. You see, Christ's plan for our lives, Christ's plan for your life, it may not be your plan, but it's the perfect plan. Because God is perfect, and He's the one orchestrating it. And He uses our trials to strengthen and grow us, and to mold us into the men and women He desires us to be. Many of you know the verse, Romans 8, 28. A verse we should all have memorized. It's a promise given directly to the beloved, to believers. He says, And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to their own purpose. Is that what it says? Those who are called according to His perfect plan. His purpose. Listen, Martha was real with Jesus. She was disappointed because he didn't come in time. Absolutely. Her heart was broken. But she didn't forget that God was on her side. She, she declares in verse 22 that she knows that whatever Jesus asks from God, she's going to receive. She didn't lose faith. Listen, though she's grieving deeply over the loss of her brother, Martha's confidence remained in Christ knowing that he was good and that he loved her. And it was through her faith that Jesus makes an, ama an amazing, an amazing pronouncement regarding his power and authority. Look at verse 23. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall, or yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now you got to understand what Jesus says right here is a hotly debated subject in Jewish culture in the first century. The Sadducees, they believe that once you died, you gone. You're dead. It's over. At that point, you know what they did? They didn't, they didn't speculate. They just said, you know what? It's, life is over. But the Pharisees, they believed in the afterlife. They believed that on the last day that there would be a resurrection. So what we see right here, it appears that Martha, she has taken the view of who? The Pharisees. She believes that there is a resurrection on the last day. She believes that she, when she dies, she will eventually go and be with God. That's why she responds the way she does to Jesus' question. She knows the grave is not the end. But in Lazarus' case, this is not the resurrection that Jesus is speaking of. No. When Jesus tells her that her brother will rise again, he's speaking of something even more remarkable. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then this is a beautiful statement that he makes. Again, we are given the fifth great I am statement of Jesus right here. Going back to the Greek, ego, ami. I am that I am. Jesus is declaring himself to be Adonai, Yahweh. He's already done it four other times. He says what? I am the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the gate. I am the door. And here he gives an incredible, an incredible pronouncement of his deity. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. In other words, I am the foundation and the power of life itself. Listen, Jesus can give us life, not because he has life, 
Jesus can give us life because he is life. Makes me think of John when he witnessed the glorified Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. He's on the island of Patmos. He's praying and then behind him, he heard the sound of rushing wind and he turned around and he saw Jesus with flaming eyes and with bronze, burnished bronze feet. And he saw this remarkable creature and it says he fell on his face as though dead. The glorified Jesus. But then the Lord Jesus Christ gave him these words. He says, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death in Hades. Beloved, what do keys do? They open things and they shut things. Those who have the keys have all authority. Who has the authority over life? Christ. Who has the authority over death? Christ. No one else. No one else. And he goes on to make a promise to those who believe in him that though they may die physically, they will live forever. Those who have been born of God, those who have received his words and had a regenerated heart, those who have been born of the Spirit will never, ever die spiritually. This is the blessed hope of a believer that when all is said and done, where are we going? We're going home. We're citizens of a better country. We will forever be in the presence of our great God and Savior. Just as Paul boldly declared, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord God Almighty. You see, for those of us who belong to Jesus, death is nothing more than a door. You know that? A lot of times I think we, we fear death, but there's nothing to fear. Because basically it's just from, if you think of like a trolley station, you're just going from one bus stop to the next. And there's nothing to fear. Your eyes will close and you will wake up where? In glory. In the presence of your great God. It's a transition from this life to the next. But this right here, it brings us, it brings us to a transition. Look at, verse, look at verse 26. And it makes us ask this question. Each of us have to ask this question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, who is coming into the world. Listen, Jesus declares the truth to Martha, and then he asks her, he asked her the question that everyone must ultimately answer. Have you trusted your life to Jesus Christ? Have you trusted all that you are to Him and surrendered it all? Says, Lord, nothing in my hands I cling simply to, the, or nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling. Have you brought it all to Him and said, Lord, it's yours. I trust in you and in you alone. Do you believe? Do you truly believe? Now understand, Martha runs back. She calls her sister Mary and tells her that Jesus has arrived and he's seeking her. But you also got to understand, there's a lot going on in this house. A lot. People from all over the area would have been at this house mourning over Lazarus. The mourning period lasted 30 days. For the first seven days, they all came and stayed at Mary and Martha's house to mourn with them. They would go into the house and they brought these short little stools or they sat on the floor for those seven days. And they just weep with them. They ate lentils. They ate bread that was round. It was made round to signify how Lazarus was now rolling into eternity. They were, they were weeping over him. They didn't wash. It was, a, it was a really dark period in their house. But then she hears this news that Jesus is there. So Mary goes running out the door to go meet him. And all the people who had come to their home to mourn over Lazarus, they see her leave. And they think that she's going to the tomb to grieve, so they follow her. Her friends, her family, they all want to be there for her. 
And I think that's a natural reaction, is it not? When we have a friend or a loved one and they lose someone who is close to them, what do we want to do as someone who cares deeply for them? We want to be there for them. We want to be there to give our condolences. We want to give there to be able to just to say something that could just maybe possibly make this pain go away. But the problem is, most time, the words that we have are quite inadequate, aren't they? Sometimes I think that we just, when we know that someone has suffered such a significant loss, there's a simple hand squeezing into the hand or putting our arm around them does so much more than words could ever do. Am I right? Sometimes people just need someone to grieve there with them. Just to let them know that you are there as their support. No words. Nothing needs to be said. Matter of fact, I remember back in California, I was the associate pastor at our prior church, and we had a, a, a family who we loved dearly, and uh, Ron and Denise. And Denise, she was young, she was only in her 40s, but she had severe diabetes. And within a year, we watched it just eat her away, and they tried everything they could. Her kidneys were shutting down. There was nothing they could do to keep her going. She went in the hospital, and she, walked, she lost all will to live. She just, uh, she wanted to go home and be with the Lord. But obviously her husband Ron didn't want that. He wanted his wife. He wanted her there with him. And I remember we were going there to the hospital, Sarah and I, just to go visit them. And as soon as we came up the elevator, her, her room was literally one, two, I won't forget it. One, two, we walked in. Ten seconds earlier, she died. Ten seconds earlier. And uh, I remember Ron, he was just grieving he was just wailing. And in that moment, all he needed was someone just to hold on and to, and to cry with him. He just needed somebody there just to say it's going to be okay without saying anything. You see, this is what Mary is going through right here. She's hurting. She needs Christ. She needs him there. She sees her Lord, and she falls at his feet and then echoes the words of her sister. Why did you not come? If you were here, this tragedy would not have happened. You see, like Martha, she doesn't know why Jesus tarried in coming. But what she does know is her brother is dead and all seems lost. Now, Tradition states that the family of the deceased in Jerusalem, they were to hire a flute player. So they would have had, a, they would have had I guess it would be a flutist. Is that their proper terminology? They would have had a flute player who would have been there at the grave and playing. But they would have also had something else there at the grave, which really would seem odd in our day, and I think it was actually odd even in, back then, is they had professional mourners. And these professional mourners were paid to come to funerals and they would stand by the, by the, by the grave and they would wail profusely. Oh, oh, they would just wail and wail and wail to gin up the emotion of the situation even more than it was. So you could picture the scene right here. You have a flute player. You have a wailer. And then you have the true, genuine people who are, who are crying and are grieving over the loss. But here in verse 33, we're given one of the most profound passages in all of Scripture. Because I don't think there's a better passage to reveal Jesus' humanity. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit, and he was greatly troubled. Now, Jesus was surrounded by men and women who were hurting and the hurt they were feeling, why? Because of our greatest enemy, death. Death. And we're seeing their pain. And we're told that Jesus was greatly troubled. Now you've got to understand, the English translation of this word does the text no good. 
You might think, oh yeah, Jesus was troubled. No, that's not what this means. In the Greek, the word used for Jesus being troubled, it is forceful. It is strong. It literally means to snort like a horse. Listen, Jesus saw this scene and he let out a gasp and his body began to tremble. Understand, Jesus saw the pain that was inflicted because of death. He saw that death and all that it had caused, and it made him angry. We see Jesus right here. He is angry. He is irate at what death has done. He was in the presence of the ravaging destruction of man's greatest enemy. And to top that all off, he sees these paid mourners who were acting like pagans who had no hope. And it just ticked him off. Listen, Jesus knew within a few days that he would forever, forever conquer sin and death. Jesus knew he was going to the cross. He knew death would finally be defeated. But in that moment, when Jesus saw the sorrow that death provoked... He entered into this family's affliction. He felt what they felt. And the same is true for us. We're told by the author of Hebrews, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Listen, even though Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus back to life, he identified with where the people were at. And in verse 35, we have the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. It doesn't say that he mourned or he wailed. The verb, the, the verb right there simply means that he had tears that were streaming down his eyes. Jesus wept over the situation. Beloved, never forget this. You have a mighty Savior who identifies with your sorrows. When you're going through difficult trials and circumstances, Jesus stands right there with you and He grieves with you. He walks with you every step. But I think this also begs the question, being the omniscient God in the flesh and knowing the people's sorrow, why didn't He arrive sooner? Why not remove the pain altogether? And this was exactly what many who were there were thinking in their minds. They know that Jesus has the power. Jesus, why did you not do anything? Look at verse 36. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind, the blind man, also have kept this man from dying? But Jesus' motives... You got to understand, they were much larger, much greater than simply removing grief. Jesus had a greater plan, a much greater plan. And right here, the miracle that he's about to perform will prove forever that he has power and authority over death. Now, there was a multitude of people who had followed Jesus to Bethany. There were even more who were there to mourn over Lazarus. Many commentators and scholars believe that there are likely thousands in attendance for this miracle. Thousands. And they were all eyewitnesses to Jesus' duel with death. But this is far from a fair fight. Far from a fair fight. Four days had passed, and even by the rabbinical tradition, the soul had departed, and there was absolutely no doubt that Lazarus was dead, dead. Put yourself in the scene. It's springtime, high noon. It's warm, body starting to decay. The entire situation that we see right here was a predetermined plan of God and was going exactly to how he wrote it. What did Jesus want for Mary? He just simply wanted her to trust him. That's it. Just faith. Look at verse 41. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Now this is one of the greatest miracles, if not, well, I would say it's the second greatest miracle, the greatest being Jesus Christ rising from the dead on the third day. But I'd put this number two. But you've got to understand, to this point, death has reigned. Death has reigned. It had always won. But on this day, oh, it had met its match. Why? Because Jesus Christ, He is the great I Am. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the Lord of glory, the author and sustainer of life. He is the final word. So try and picture this. The stone is rolled away. Everybody is sitting back in anticipation. And that's a pretty much airtight seal. So the minute that stone is rolled away, you know what the first thing they would have noticed? It would have been a nice, beautiful smell. The putrefying, just smell of a decay coming from the body. And within these tombs in the Jewish, in the Jewish culture, first century Jewish culture, it wasn't just one body likely in this tomb. Normally it was up to eight. Two on one wall, two on the other wall, two on the back, two in the center. That's how they laid, that's how they laid their dead within these structures. So the stone is rolled away. And then Jesus utters the command. Lazarus, come forth. And I think it's interesting that Jesus calls him out by name because if Jesus didn't call him out by name, he might have had, he might have had seven other people walking out and saying, I didn't call you, I called him. <laughs> no, it would have just been Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And at Christ's call, Lazarus' heart begins to beat. His capillaries start to fill. His lungs would have started to expand. Brain activity starting to take place. And then he would have sat up. Then he would have edged himself off the stone slowly. Can you imagine seeing that? Something tells me when he walked out of that tomb, there was probably a good handful of people who needed to be resuscitated after seeing a dead man walk out. Mary and Martha, they work as fast as they can to unwrap his body. Then they begin to hug and kiss him. It's amazing how quickly this funeral turned into a party, huh? This is the seventh and the final sign that John gives us right here. And it provides us the miracle of miracles. You see, Lazarus would eventually die again, but death had no hold on him. He belonged to Jesus. Just as it no longer has a hold on those of us who have trusted our lives to Christ, and I believe that John gave us this story to help us have a proper perspective on the here and now. Can this life be hard, beloved? It could be hard. It could be really hard. It could feel unfair. But God wants us to know that all of our times of sorrow will eventually turn to times of joy. He wants us to know that even when we don't fully understand, His plans are perfect. You see, as a Christian, God uses my momentary afflictions to grow me in my dependence on Him. He puts us in trials so that through the perseverance, through those trials, what happens to us? We grow in our faith. We are strengthened. And this is a beautiful promise He gives us in Revelation chapter 21. He says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. You see, we've been given this account to grow our faith. But there's an even greater motive for John giving us this miracle. You know that? The true motive for why he gave us this miracle. Jump back and look at verse 4. 
But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, for it is what? For the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Beloved, what is the ultimate reason for everything? God's glory. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. Why did He create the heavens and the earth? His glory. Why did He make Adam and Eve in the garden knowing that they would be marred by sin and death? And why did He choose to send the Lord Jesus Christ to redeem humanity back to Himself? God's glory. Why did Jesus allow this family to endure so much suffering and grief only to raise Lazarus back to life after four days? God's glory. Understand, Jesus stayed away until Lazarus was dead for two reasons. Yes, it was to strengthen and to build the faith of his followers. But the ultimate reason was so that God would be glorified through this situation. Listen, Jesus lived and he died for his Father's glory. And nothing happens by chance. Nothing in our lives is without purpose. Even the small things, sometimes that we think are trivial, nothing happens by chance. Whether it be sorrow or sickness or death, nothing happens to you that God does not permit for a reason. Everything. And the main reason is this. As a Christian, the trials of my life are ultimately for God's glory. It's all about Him. And there's no situation, no circumstance that comes our way that God cannot be glorified through. It doesn't matter if it's an impossible boss, a loveless marriage, a dysfunctional family, a medical diagnosis. Whatever comes our way, God can be glorified through that. For us, when the trials come, we need to be ready to ask, Lord, how can I honor you through this? Now, our normal response is to say, Lord, why is this happening to me? Or, Lord, can you please just get this over quickly? But that's not the response he wants us to have. He wants us to come to him and say, okay, Lord, let your will be, not my will. Your will be done. How can I honor you and love you through this, through this difficult situation? You see, Christian maturity is learning to take every situation that we face, knowing that whatever comes our way, the good, the bad, yes, even the ugly, God can be exalted through us. His name glorified. And He is worthy, amen? Oh, that wasn't a very big amen. He is worthy, amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus has done an amazing miracle. And it's interesting because as we come here to the end of chapter 11 and we see <laughs> this shows without a shadow of a doubt Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one. Hello, look, Jesus is here. But what do the Pharisees do? Does this make them believe? Do they see this and say, you know what, well, we've been wrong this entire time. Maybe we need to reassess the situation. No. No. From this point forward, Jesus, he has performed this miracle because he knows that it will seal his fate. From this point forward, this miracle guarantees that he is going to be put to death within the week. That's how much they hate what he has just done. And we will get into that next week, Lord willing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can I have the band come up? Father, again, just thank you so much for this time to be able to get in your word and the truths that are contained with it, within it. And we do, we praise you and we thank you for your love. We thank you so much for all that you have done for us. We no longer have to fear death. We no longer have to worry about our future because you are the resurrection and the life. You have taken everything and your plan is perfect, Lord. Through your plan, we know how the story ends. We know to be absent from this body is to be present with you. We can cry out with Paul, Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? There's none. Because we belong to the living God. 
And we praise you for that, Lord, throughout this week. Just strengthen us. Keep our eyes fixed on you. Allow us to get into your word and draw near to you. Allow us to lift our voices to you and to be open with you in prayer about what's going on in our lives. And to trust in your sovereignty. To trust in you and what you have in store for us. Because you are good. You are great. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.